At the end of the 19th century, the Danish king Christian IX and his queen Louisa succeeded in marrying their six children into the leading European royal families, and Christian IX thus became known as the father-in-law of Europe. Today, his family are all over Europe, and these royal descendants have, quite exceptionally, chosen to come together and talk about their family's incredible story, a story that has been passed down to them through the generations. In addition, this great royal family has also made private photos and films available, many of which have never been seen in public before. This episode is about Christian IX's oldest son, Frederick, who becomes King of Denmark and about his descendants, who ended up in Norway, Sweden, Belgium and Luxembourg. Denmark, 1853. Prince Christian, Princess Louisa and the four children they have had so far live a relatively modest existence in the Yellow Palace. Via convoluted paths, the German Prince Christian has just become heir to the throne of Denmark, which means that his son Frederick can now also look forward to becoming king. Instead of the usual practice of being educated at home by his parents, Prince Frederick is now sent to a private school. So this was a a new thinking, way of thinking, you might say, but it nevertheless gave the coming king a uh, better impression of how society and, and, and ordinary citizens were thinking and, and living. But the shy Frederick does not get along with his schoolmates. They tease him. It was not that easy in the beginning because he had a, 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 quite a German accent, so um, he, he needed to, to work on his language as well in those days. In 1863, Frederick's father became king of Denmark. His brother, Wilhelm, became king of Greece, and his sister, Alexandra, married the heir to the British throne. Crown Prince Frederick begins studying politics at Oxford, and this allows for regular visits to Alexandra and his brother-in-law, Edward. During these visits, Frederick and Edward's sister, Helena, become interested in each other. But when Helena's mother, Queen Victoria, hears about it, she immediately puts a stop to the relationship. Instead, attention is turned towards Sweden, where the Swedish king's daughter, Princess Lovisa, is 16 years old. Christian IX sends a telegram to the Swedish king saying that his son would like to visit them. A week later, Frederick travels to Sweden, and four days later, the marriage has been arranged. The tall, intelligent Lovisa is an excellent match on paper. She came with so many jewels from Sweden at the bad that she covered, when they were all put together, a huge billiard table, you know, the size of a billiard table. It's from there to there, full with her jewels. After their marriage in 1869, the newlyweds move into Amalienborg Palace in Copenhagen. They are also presented with a small Charlottenlund Palace for use as a summer residence and it is here on the coast, with a view of Sweden, that they spend most of their time and where the majority of their eight children are born. The children receive a strict upbringing, spending a lot of time outdoors. Every morning they walk from a million ball out to Schillandon, probably just under 10 miles, the whole thing out and back again, about 10 miles, before breakfast. My grandmother didn't enjoy it. Princess Lovisa, in particular, has a major influence on the children's upbringing. Among them, there is a future king of Denmark and a future king of Norway. She was very strict with her children, and uh, she ran after them with a stick. And then they had a good hiding place because their father, he had a writing desk, so they could go under the desk and hide behind. And then he could calm his wife down, hopefully. The children do not dine with their parents. Until they were 18, they had their meals in the children's dining room. And my grandmother always had veal cutlets with 
potatoes and spinach. Every day, seven days a week. Princess Lovisa, who has lost both her parents, feels very lonely in Denmark. She was not very beautiful, she wasn't pretty. And of course, Queen Louise was charming, lovely, beautifully turned out. Her three daughters were charming, lovely, beautifully turned out. They were actually beauties. And here comes this tall, not very beautiful woman. And I think she had a very hard time, actually. She was never very much loved by anybody in the family. Lovisa seeks comfort in the Danish evangelical home mission, and husband and wife begin to live separate lives. Frederick spends most of his life waiting to become king because his father lives to be an old man. I don't think Christian IX gave uh, his son much possibility of, of, of um, showing himself alone. He was probably rather under the thumb and, and great influence of, of Christian IX. Even on his 60th birthday, the crown prince is put in his place. At the end of the dinner, he wishes to convey his thanks to everybody who had shown him their participation in his birthday. Polite and being brought up the way he was, he obviously asks his father, the king, to permission to speak so as to thank everybody. And his father says, it is not appropriate, be seated. Christian IX dies in 1906, and his son and daughter-in-law now ascend to the Danish throne as King Frederick VIII and Queen Louisa. A few days after Frederick VIII's coronation, his daughter Louisa dies unexpectedly. That was very sad that night, because they were all, you know, full of tears and very, 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 very down like that. She was only 31 when she died. And enjoyed that she had, and they couldn't save her, unfortunately. There was so that they would be off the floor. His fate was a bit unfortunate, you might say, and he's, all, he's only remembered by, by, his, by his death, so to say, which is uh, too bad because he was definitely a, a very um, a kind and profound person. Frederick VIII has a bad heart, and on his way home from recuperating in Nice, he spends the night in a hotel in Hamburg. Here, later in the evening, he goes out without telling anyone. But the king suddenly falls ill, and he collapses unconscious onto some steps. At half past ten, the king's body is placed on a wooden table in the town's mortuary, tagged with the number 1653, surrounded by eight half-naked bodies. When the hotel manager tracks down the king, he demands that the body be handed over to him. Initially, the cab driver refuses to drive with the body, and it's only when the hotel manager offers the cabbie a gold coin that he accepts the fare. At four in the morning, the body of the dead king is laid out on a random bed in the hotel. The 
the king is dead, long live the king, is the cry later in the same day, as the deceased king's oldest son is proclaimed King Christian X of Denmark. A few days later, Frederick VIII's funeral takes place, and because of the unusual circumstances of his father's death, his son ensures that it is a particularly magnificent occasion. The new king follows the funeral procession with his sons, Frederick and Knud. Christian X experiences two world wars during his reign. Since 1864, a large number of Danes in Schleswig have been forced to live under German rule. But at the end of the First World War, a referendum is held to fix the border between Denmark and Germany. And in 1920, North Schleswig returns to Denmark. One day in July, King Christian X, on his white horse, rode over the old trencher into the reunited Schleswig or Sonoyulan, which was a, I think, a pivotal point for him and certainly very, very important for everybody in Denmark. The tall King Christian is known as a very formal and headstrong monarch, but he's able to relax on the beach at the royal summer residence in Skane, northern Denmark. His queen, German-born Alexandrina, is very interested in sports, and as well as being a keen tennis player and golfer, she enjoys sailing too. The pair's oldest son, Crown Prince Frederick, is much warmer and more down to earth than his formal father. He is an officer in the Navy and loves life at sea. On the land, the Crown Prince's great passion is cars. He was given his first car at the age of 18, and even though he has a chauffeur available to him, he much prefers to drive himself. In 1922, Frederick is briefly engaged to the Greek princess Olga, who is also a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe. I suppose my father sort of looked around sort of here and there, hoping to, to, to meet a, a, a young uh, lady of, uh, of a royal house, with the way it was still in those days, uh, more or less foregone conclusion. But he met my mother and, uh, and that, was, that was it. In 1935, the now 36-year-old Danish crown prince has no doubts at all about marrying the Swedish crown prince's 25-year-old daughter, Princess Ingrid. After the wedding in Stockholm, the newlyweds sailed to Denmark on the royal yacht Danapol. In bright sunshine, half a million Copenhageners bid the royal couple welcome. On the 9th of April, 1940, Denmark is occupied by German soldiers. My grandfather had his habits and nothing was going to break his habits, certainly not the German occupation. So every morning, as he always used to do, he got on his horse and he went for a ride around Copenhagen. And that continued and that became symbolic for people. On one of his morning rides, the king falls from his horse and has to spend the last two years of his life in a wheelchair. Of course, I wasn't born to be a queen, and, and uh, I very well remember not being the future heir. I mean, I, I knew perfectly well that I, 
I would, I would not be uh, Queen of Denmark. Christian X dies in 1947, and in the middle of his personal grief, Crown Prince Frederick has to accept the people's salute to him as Denmark's new king. Frederick IX has the ability to be both royal and down to earth at the same time. Down to earth and, and the capacity to be able to speak to anybody. I mean, the man in the street would say sort of, hi, Frederick, and he drove past in the car. The king has a very special interest, trains. He loved the trains and he had all the timetables, all the books, and he would always, he always knew when trains were arriving and trains were leaving. So when in the autumn of 1947, the royal couple travel to England to take part in Princess Elizabeth's wedding, the journey, of course, begins by train. We stood on, on the quay when my father arrived to his Big surprise, and we were so eager to to give him a big hug and a and a welcome. Any other father, I mean, I, I he was a very warm person, and um, he was always there if we needed him. It eventually becomes clear that Frederick and Ingrid's three daughters will not have a brother who can succeed to the throne. Thus, a new law of succession is put to a referendum and results in 13-year-old Margrethe suddenly becoming the country's new heir to the throne instead of her uncle, Prince Knud. And I found that, well, rather daunting, of course. I felt very shy about the fact that people were sort of talking about that, oh, one day you will be queen. I loathed people talking about, to me about it. I mean, I felt it very embarrassing that people should sort of take too much notice of me in that way. Classical music plays a major part in the life of the king. He conducted an orchestra as a, as a good musician, not just as a funny hobby. We'd often seen my father practice in front of the um, gramophone at home, where he would use to practice, of course, standing up uh, in front of his, the score. Like any other self-respecting sailor, the king has a number of impressive tattoos. He had tattoos, yes. <laughs> I think he'd had them done, I think, in England, actually, um, when he was quite young. There were many other members of the, of, of the royal fam family in those days who, who had tattoos, more or less. I think my father perhaps had more than the others. To do so, Frederick IX chooses to remain outside of politics, and the royal family is now more of a role model for the ideal middle-class family. As a child, we, of course, went to school, and when we came home uh, in the afternoons, my mother always had tea, and my parents would see to it that they were at home around tea time. The youngest of the Yet King Frederick will not allow the pair to marry before the princess turns 18. This happens the 30th of August, 1964, and three weeks later, a sumptuous wedding takes place in Athens. The groom, like his bride and both his parents, is a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe, and Constantine quickly establishes a close relationship with his own father-in-law. He was a very open-hearted person, and uh, it was extremely easy to get on with him. And um, he loved it if one pulled his leg, and uh, I used to do that all the time, so we were got on extremely well. Margrethe is the next daughter to be married. While studying economy in London, she had met the French Count Henri de Montpezat whilst he was working for the French Embassy. Oh 
The heir to the throne thus broke with the tradition that required the future regent to find his or her spouse from within a royal or noble house. Benedicta is the last of King Frederick's children to marry. Her wedding takes place in 1968, where she marries the German prince Richard of Berleburg. With 13 months between them, Margrethe gives birth to sons Joachim and Frederick. And King Frederick is able to follow the first years of their lives before he dies in 1972. The regent in Denmark, one of the world's oldest monarchies, is now called Queen Margrethe II. The Queen and Prince Henrik reside at Amelienborg Palace, where the Queen's great-grandfather, Christian IX, used to live in his day. And in the spring and autumn, they enjoy spending time at Freilensborg Castle, where the big family gatherings used to take place when Christian IX was alive and was known as the father-in-law of Europe. It's also here that official dinners for foreign heads of state are held. Queen Margrethe has many artistic talents and, among other accomplishments, has regularly designed costumes for TV, theatre and the ballet. And the Queen also enjoys decoupage, cutting and arranging prints and pictures in new and exciting designs. She, um, she has this wonderful gift of drawing, colors, painting. I mean, everything she touches from an artistic point of view uh, comes out brilliantly. And um, it's an enormous relaxation for her in a way too, because she can do her artistic life and her official life. And she can cut off completely from the official life when she's being an artist. Today, the Queen's youngest sister lives in exile in England with her husband, Constantine, the former King of Greece. And since her marriage to Prince Richard, Princess Benedicta has lived in Berleborg, Germany. Queen Margrethe's oldest son, Crown Prince Frederick, successfully rises to the physical and mental challenge of completing one of the Danish military's toughest training programs as a Royal Danish Navy frogman. He has a university degree and is a captain in the Royal Danish Air Force. In 2000, the Crown Prince completes a 3,000 kilometer journey in the harsh environment of Greenland. The four month long expedition is carried out on dog sled when the Crown Prince one day takes over from his mother, it will be as King Frederick X. Yeah, Crown Prince Frederick's younger brother, Prince Joachim, is an agricultural college graduate, and he now farms the land around Schackenborg Castle, where he lives with Princess Alexandra and their children. Returning to 1892, the father-in-law of Europe and his descendants are, as usual, spending their summer together at Fredensborg Castle. Amongst his grandchildren are Prince Karl of Denmark and Princess Maud of England. And it's this summer that warm feelings begin to develop between the tall Navy officer and the petite, sporty princess. And four years later, a wedding is held in England. They were married in Buckingham Palace, in the chapel in Buckingham Palace. And Queen Victoria was there. Queen Victoria, as Princess Maud's grandmother, has given the marriage her stamp of approval. The newlyweds settle in Copenhagen, completely unaware of what the future holds for them. When Napoleon was defeated in 1814, the Associated Peace Treaty demanded that Denmark hand over Norway to Sweden. After that, 
uh, we were in union with Sweden until 1905. At the end of the 19th century, uh, there was a big nationalistic sort of movement in Norway to again become an independent nation. And uh, so in 1905, they got an excuse really <laughs> to, uh, to uh, say that enough was enough and they did no longer want to have the same king as Sweden. Norway dissolves the union and a candidate for the throne is found who gains the support of all the great powers, not least that of King Edward VII. This candidate is his own son-in-law, Prince Karl of Denmark. King Christian rather was asked by the Norwegian government if uh, it was acceptable to, to him that, that Prince Karl would become King of Norway. Uh, but uh, my grandfather, he asked uh, for a bit of time to think about it and he came back and said yes on one condition and that was that uh, the Norwegian people should decide if they wanted him as king or not. A referendum shows a clear majority for Prince Karl and Crown Prince Frederick's son can now become the new king of Norway. Two days later the royal pair leave their apartment in Copenhagen and set sail for the Norwegian capital Christiania, later to be known as Oslo. They have their two-year-old son with them, who up until the day before was called Alexander. However, his father decides that they should both take new Norwegian names. My grandfather took the name King Håkon and gave my father the name of Olaf. Two old names in the old Viking kings. They arrived by boat and in the Oslo Fjord they changed over to a a Norwegian boat and came here in on a very snowy, cold, blistery November day in, in 1905. Håkon, Maud and little Olaf receive a wonderful reception and they move into the royal palace in the centre of Oslo. The palace in Oslo is a big palace, but it had, a, a, the, the, when the Swedes moved out, they'd actually moved out most of the furniture. <laughs> there wasn't very much left when the, when the Norwegian family moved in. The palace was under restoration, uh, so um, I think they spent one winter in, at the uh, Big de Kongsgård, and I think that was a very cold experience. <laughs> it was certainly not built for living in the, in, there in the winter, and apparently uh, King Håkon would receive his, his ministers wearing ski boots because it was so cold. The little family do the best they can to become Norwegian, learning to ski almost immediately. The Queen skis well, wearing stays and an ankle-length coat. I think with our way of life, our outdoor life, I suited her very well. She learned quickly to ski. She was a very outdoor lady, actually. And I think that she was probably the first woman who rode a bicycle. She was very, very sporty. She had horses and she loved riding. Um, uh, she had them out at uh, big day, which is close to Oslo, and she used to go there riding. I believe my, my grandfather um, did do some riding as well when he was uh, younger, and I know that he was very fond of his mother. Olaf grows up without any siblings and is educated alone at the palace by a tutor. However, his mother also teaches him every so often, especially in practical subjects such as drawing. He must have had a fairly, fairly lonely childhood as a small boy. Now when he got older he started skiing and, and got friends and he, he also began, started in their ordinary school and so he got his classmates and so he, he broadened his, uh, his view as far as friends were concerned after a while. 
he told me um, a lot about skiing. He was very fond of skiing. He used to jump as well in, in Holmenkollen. He uh, used to go up to one of the mountain peaks around there and ski straight down uh, together with a couple of friends of his. Crown Prince Olaf has a great interest in sailing, and when he is in his mid-twenties, the Olympic Games are held in Holland. They had trials in Norway before they uh, picked the boat that was going. He won the trials, and uh, after that he thought that maybe he was a bit young to, uh, to go to the Olympics alone, and he thought that the designer was a better helmsman than he was, so he stepped down and uh, the designer was captain on the boat and he became uh, a crew. Sailing on the Crown Prince's boat, Norna, they win a gold medal for Norway. But the medal is not all that Olaf wins. My mother and father got engaged during the Olympic Games in, in 1928. They managed to keep it uh, away from the press and, and everybody until they actually announced their engagement a little later. Olaf's chosen bride is the Swedish princess Merta, who is a great-grandchild of the father-in-law of Europe. Thus, like his father before him, he marries his own cousin. After having given birth to two daughters, the celebrations are even greater when in 1937, Merta gives birth to a son, Harald. Norway, like Denmark, is invaded by the Germans on the 9th of April, 1940. We then packed in a hurry, left our home, uh, and drove very, very fast <laughs> to, into town, and uh, and uh, got away like, like that. We took a train away from Oslo. And because they managed to actually sink the uh, cruiser that was coming in the fjord, uh, it delayed the Germans enough to let us and the government and parliament, or parts of it anyway, uh, to get out of Oslo before the Germans actually occupied Oslo. Initially, the king and the crown prince seek safety in northern Norway. But two months later, they flee the country and are forced to spend the next five years abroad. My grandfather and father went to England, uh, and stayed in London during the five years. My mother and my two sisters and I, we went to America. We stayed in a house just outside of Washington, D.C. When Håkon returns to Norway in 1945, he receives a rapturous reception in the festively decorated capital. King Håkon dies in 1957, aged 85. Norway's monarch is now called King Olaf V. On his ascension, the new king has already been a widower for many years. To nobody's apparent concern, both his daughters marry commoners. But there is a great resistance when Crown Prince Harald announces that he intends to marry Sonja Haraldsson, the daughter of a Norwegian manufacturer. The couple must wait for nine years before the king finally gives his approval. After the wedding, the couple return to the palace in an open car. It was overwhelming the way people actually cheered us up the main road and up to the palace. It's really unbelievable. After having sent the newlyweds off on their honeymoon, the wedding guests overnight out of town. So the next morning the surprise was quite big when we went into the dining room to have breakfast with all the guests. They didn't know anything. So that was great fun. And we walked out of the main door with rig sacks on our backs and went up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. 
Crown Princess Sonia first gives birth to a daughter, Merta Louise, and then a son, Håkon Magnus. My parents wanted um, my sister and myself to have a fairly normal upbringing. We went to regular schools in Oslo and uh, to kindergartens, a kindergarten in Asker where we grew up. Crown Prince Harald is a dedicated sailor and on a number of occasions represents Norway at the Olympic Games. In 1987, he and his crew become world champions in the one-ton Fram. All the royal family are very interested in sports and outdoor pursuits, not least skiing. The Norwegian and Danish royal family are closely linked and the two queens, Sonja and Margrethe, go skiing together every year. King Olaf dies in 1991, and his son now ascends to the throne as King Harald V. Together with Sonja, he's crowned in Trondheim Cathedral. This means that son Håkon is now the new crown prince, and he loves a physical challenge. It started with skiing, alpine skiing. Um, and then it went on to uh, whitewater kayaking and paragliding. And it's always been a strength, uh, I thought, to do things that um, are challenging. Because through that, I learned how to handle situations that are not well known to me, uh, that might seem scary when you first uh, look at it but then you realize that you can actually master the situation. And that's been a strength to me in, in other areas uh, of life as well. Like his father before him, Crown Prince Håkon falls in love with a commoner, Meta Marvit. Meta Marvit is a single mother of a little boy, and feelings again run high in Norway. Yet the Crown Prince is not in any doubt about his choice, and the pair marry in Oslo Cathedral in the summer of 2001. As Crown Prince, Håkon has to spend a lot of his life waiting, waiting to be king himself. I am preparing for the role of becoming the monarch one day. But at the same time, I do have uh, worthwhile things to do in the present. It's, uh, I'm not only preparing for something that comes later. Um, my wife and myself, we do represent already um, both in Norway uh, and abroad. Back in Denmark in 1896, the woman behind the father-in-law of Europe, Queen Louisa, is once again involved in the process of deciding who is to marry whom. Amongst the children of Louisa and Christian IX's eldest son, Frederick, can now be found the next king of Denmark, the next king of Norway, and daughter Ingeborg, who is now being matched with Prince Karl of Sweden. He was over two meters tall, and he was very handsome. So I think that it was not difficult for my grandmother to uh, Princess Ingeborg to fall in love with him. Cousins Princess Ingeborg and Prince Karl are unexpectedly engaged during a dinner. Christian the Ninth, a grandfather, hit his glass and said, it's a great joy for me to declare the engagement between my granddaughter Ingeborg and Karl of Sweden. His first remark was, it shouldn't be before tomorrow. And my grandmother was flabbergasted because she'd never heard of it before. When she was a child, Princess Ingeborg's father had demanded that she and her siblings walk many kilometers every day. So when she married and she got to Sweden, she never walked anymore. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm not going to walk in the garden. I walked enough when I was a young girl. And now that I'm in Sweden, I do what I want. Many years later, Prince Karl became seriously ill. My grandfather was very ill, he had pneumonia, and um, his brother Oscar came to visit him. And he told him, uh, uh, Dear Carl, I'm coming to say goodbye to you because you are going to die of pneumonia. So we won't meet anymore. 
and we won't meet uh, after life also because I know where I'm going. I'm going up, but I don't know where you are going, so I'm sure we are not going to meet after life. That made my grandfather so furious that two days later he was up on his feet again. In the years between 1919 and 1929, Prince Karl and Princess Ingeborg's three daughters all marry well. Princess Margareta marries the Danish Prince Axel, who, like herself, is a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe. Princess Merta marries her cousin, Crown Prince Olaf of Norway, who is also a descendant of the father-in-law of Europe. And Princess Astrid marries the Belgian Crown Prince Leopold, and in doing so, the family spreads itself to ever more countries. But a tragic destiny awaits her. After the marriage in Sweden in 1926, Crown Prince Leopold hurries back to Belgium so he can receive his new wife when she arrives by boat. And when she came down dressed in white, the gangway, he ran to meet her halfway. And I think it was maybe the first time that you saw a young couple embracing in public in 1926. and they ran to each other. And that made her immediately beloved by the Belgian population. The newlywed couple and King Albert and Queen Elizabeth are keen mountain climbers. But in February 1934, a tragedy occurs. It was a very uh, big tragedy that uh, my grandfather, Albert I, he went climbing rocks and um, a rock fell on his head and he was killed on the spot. Completely without warning, Leopold and Astrid are suddenly crowned king and queen of Belgium. father lost control of an open car and she was ejected against the only tree that was there. It's a great hole in our lives, all of us. After only a few years as queen, Astrid is dead at the age of 29. The oldest of her three children, Josephine Charlotte, is just seven years old. When the accident happens, the children are together with Queen Astrid's lady-in-waiting. And she said, you know, your mother has a cold and she won't be back tomorrow. She will have to stay a little longer in Switzerland. And I said, no, Madame du Roy, I know she's dead. We told that I had premonitions, and I still have them. Just before Queen Astrid died, she had written a letter to her mother. In the letter, she wrote about Josephine Charlotte, who was known as Joe. Little Joe has found a white hair on my head. And she told me, you know, she said, now, Mama, you are going to die. And my poor grandmother, Princess Ingeborg, got that letter after 
My mother died and it was a terrible shock for her. When the Second World War breaks out, King Leopold takes supreme command of the armed forces. Yet after a few weeks of fighting and against the wishes of his government, he allows his forces to capitulate to the Germans. The Germans take him prisoner and he is interned in his castle, Larkin, outside of Brussels until 1944. After which he and his children are moved to Germany as prisoners of war. There was barbed wire and we had, uh, there were SS soldiers guarding us with dogs. Immediately before the end of the war, the family situation is critical. We had nothing else to, nothing more to eat. We went to the garden and took dandelions to eat. And he was very scared that maybe the Gestapo would shoot us. But on the 7th of May, 1945, the family is liberated by American soldiers. We got uh, rations from the Americans, and that was fantastic. I'd never tasted peanut butter in my, in my life, and I was given a tin of peanut butter, and I ate the whole tin. I was very sick after that. After the war, a large part of the family gathers in Sweden to celebrate Ingeborg and Karl's golden wedding anniversary. I met an old man who had big white moustache, and uh, he was very sweet with me. And uh, my grandmother said, that's my favorite cousin. He's called Goggy, Uncle Goggy for you. And so I said, Uncle Goggy, how nice to meet you. And uh, I had a, a long dress, <laughs> one of my first ones, with a décolleté. And Uncle Goggy took his teeth off his mouth and started to run after me and to put his teeth into my décolleté. So I said, Uncle Axel, Uncle Axel, save me from Uncle Goggy, that old man who wants to throw his teeth into my décolleté. <laughs> that was my first impression of the Scandinavian family. They were always making tricks. King Leopold earned the reproach of the Belgian people for having surrendered to the Germans so quickly. And his popularity is not increased when he remarries, this time to a... of the father-in-law of Europe gather together to celebrate the wedding of Philip to his Belgian-born fiancée, Mathilde, in December 1999. And as such, become the country's first female monarch. In 1952, Prince Jean of Luxembourg proposes to Princess Josephine Charlotte of Belgium. The princess says yes, and then has to tell her father what she has decided. I sat on his knees and I got hold of him and I said, Papa, I'm engaged. And he said, to whom? <laughs> to whom? And I said, to Jean of Luxembourg. Ah, and he relaxed. <laughs> The couple are married the following year, ensuring that the descendants of the father-in-law of Europe can now also be found in Europe's only major grand duchy, the tiny nation of Luxembourg. The reigning grand duchess abdicates in 1964, 
Her only son, Jean, now becomes Grand Duke, and Josephine Charlotte can now call herself Grand Duchess. The Grand Ducal couple sit on Luxembourg's throne for the next 36 years. But at the turn of the millennium, the Grand Duke chooses to abdicate and turn the throne over to his son, Henri. Grand Duke Henri is married to the Cuban-born commoner, Maria Theresa Mestre, and they have a total of five children, so the succession is definitely secure. In the next episode, we will follow the eldest daughter of the father-in-law of Europe, namely Princess Alexandra, who was sent to England to make an impression on Queen Victoria and her son, Edward. The miserable young Princess Alexandra came on her own, without anybody to accompany her, all the way to Osborne, where she spent a day or two with Queen Victoria. She must have been terrified. <laughs>